Let me set the scene. I want us all to imagine that we're not in a conference room in Parramatta, but instead on a tropical coral reef. Now what I'm guessing you're all imagining is something not too dissimilar from this. We're surrounded by dense thickets of corals of different shapes and colors, and schools of beautiful fish are swimming all around us. Now the defining feature of this image and of most coral reefs is the sheer abundance of life. One square kilometer of coral reef can provide enough fish to keep 300 people fed. And for any area of reef, there are more species of animals and plants and algae and fungi than in any other ecosystem on the planet, except perhaps the most productive of rainforests. Now I want us to take a step back. I want us to look at something a little less obvious in this image. Let's look at the water. Now, it's actually a bit difficult, isn't it? It's like me asking you to look at the air in the room. And this is another of these key features of coral reefs. They thrive in areas with clear, warm water. But the reason that the water is clear is that there are very few nutrients in it and very little plankton. So in other marine ecosystems, nutrients in the water help planktonic algae to grow. And these planktonic algae get eaten by microscopic herbivores, which get eaten by tiny predators and so on and so on until the ecosystem's complete. But that's not how it is on coral reefs. They don't have these external inputs of fertilizer to help the ecosystem along. And this is a question that's, this leads to a question that's plagued marine scientists, puzzled marine scientists for a really long time. In fact, back in 1842, Charles Darwin began to ask the question, how do coral reefs survive as oases of life in what are essentially marine deserts? Just as an aside, this book, The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs, was published in 1842, which is 17 years before On the Origin of Species was first published. So if you take nothing else home with you from my talk today, just remember that Darwin was a marine biologist. <laughs> so in the 177 years since Darwin began to ask this question, we've come to realize that instead of relying on external inputs of nutrients, coral reefs actually rely on really highly efficient recycling of the waste within the system. And while essentially you don't need extra nutrients coming in from outside, if you can recycle everything that's already there. So while we know that this recycling is really important, what we don't know is really anything else about it. We don't know what animals are responsible for it. We don't know how the system works. But recently we've started to look at different organisms on the reef and see if they play important roles in recycling. And one group that looks pretty promising are these guys. They're called cryptobenthic fishes. Now, half of science is learning how to use fancy language to make your work sound more impressive than it really is. <laughs> so we'll break the word down. Crypto comes from cryptic, which means camouflaged. And benthic means to do with the seabed. So this is a group of camouflaged fish species that live on the seabed. Not too fancy. To make it even easier, from now on, I'm just going to call these guys cryptos. So here I am telling you I study camouflaged fish while I have a literal rainbow of them on a screen behind me. Well, I'm not completely lying to you. First, while there are lots of really beautiful cryptos out there, the majority are honestly more on the greeny brown spectrum. They're like this guy down here. Second, there's an issue of scale here. They're actually this big. Cryptos are the smallest vertebrates in the ocean. They're the, they're the smallest animals with a backbone in the sea. And some of the really small cryptos are some of the smallest vertebrates on the planet. To highlight how small they actually are, I've actually got one of the bigger fish I study here to show you. So this is a Queensland pygmy goby. And if you aren't sat in the front row, this is it on my finger. Now I need to highlight, this isn't a baby fish. This is a fully grown adult. For me, this is a monster. <laughs> My fish tails suck. But if they're this small, how on earth do they actually do anything important? Well, for a start, there are a lot of them. On any square meter of reef, even in the worst condition, if it's just algae and rubble, you can still find 25 to 30 of these little guys, sometimes up to 100. In fact, this guy, the Queensland pygmy goby, is one of the most abundant fish on the entire Great Barrier Reef. As a demonstration, this screen here is about seven square meters. If it was a patch of reef and we were looking for these fish, I would be absolutely astonished if we didn't find almost 200 fish in this area. 
So we start to see that just by their sheer abundance, these little fish might be quite important. But still, they are really tiny. These 200 fish would easily fit in a medium-sized coffee cup, and they'd weigh less than that would if it was full. So how are they important? Well, they do three things really well. The first thing is the, they grow. So these little fish settle out on the reef, and then they eat the waste and detritus and tiny animals, basically anything they can fit in their mouths. Now, as you probably guessed, their mouths are really, really tiny. But if you were a millimeter long, th these fish would be scary. <laughs> now, this is an adorned pygmy goby. These guys settle out on the reef, and they eat, and they eat, and they eat. And within two weeks of being on the reef, they increase in length by about 50%. If we look at all fish on the reef and treat growth as just increase in length, over 80% of fish growth is by cryptos. That's the first thing cryptos do well. They eat and grow really rapidly. The second thing cryptos do is they die. And they die in prodigious rates. In some species, 7 to 8% of the population dies every day. That's 8 in 100 fish dying every single day. This fish, the adorned pygmy goby, actually holds a Guinness World Record as the shortest lived vertebrate on Earth. They spend about three weeks floating out in the blue. They then settle out onto a reef, have 10 days to mature into adulthood, and then they have just over three weeks to find a mate, reproduce, and then possibly even change sex and reproduce again. The oldest one of these ever found on a coral reef is 59 days old. So while these are the shortest ones we know about, there are lots of even smaller fish that we haven't even studied. And for any crypto whose lifespans we have looked at, they're always measured in weeks or months. These things don't live very long. But what's really interesting is how these fish die. They don't die of old age. If you catch these on the reef and put them in a fish tank, they can live a couple of years. No, cryptos don't die. They get eaten. But they don't normally get eaten by big, ferocious predators like this rock cod. The normal predator of a crypto is another crypto, or even something like this little mantis shrimp up at the top. So a difference in length between two cryptos of 11 millimeters, so about as wide as my little finger, changes those two fish from being friends to being food. Don't listen to Finding Nemo. <laughs> this guy, who's not the same guy I showed you before, the one on the left, would be licking his lips at the sight of this guy. So what we have on coral reefs are spectacularly complex food webs. We've got these little cryptos eating sludge and waste on the bottom, and then they're eaten by fish or shrimp a tiny bit bigger than them, and then they're eaten by fish a bit bigger than them, and so on and so on, layer after layer. And at the foundations of these food chains are the cryptos. But if these guys are dying so regularly, how on earth do they not just die out entirely? Why are there any cryptos left? And this brings us to the third thing cryptos do really well. They reproduce, and they've got some special tricks in this. So if you're a big fish, generally, out on the reef, you just scatter your eggs into the blue and let them wash away. Things like coral trout and snapper, the big reef fish that we like to eat, they can make hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of eggs at a time. And they let them go in the blue, and if two or three of those babies su survive and make it to a reef somewhere, then all's good. Their job as a parent's done. Yeah, great. And if not, then it doesn't really matter. There's always next time. It might be a month away, it might be a year away, but by all means, those fish will probably still be there. Even better, if you're a big fish and you send your babies out floating in the blue, there's a chance they might actually travel quite a long distance. We're talking tens or hundreds of kilometers here. And what this means is that your babies will be safe, your genetic legacy will be safe if something happens to your home. It's really good if you're a big fish. But unfortunately for cryptos, that's not an option. The biggest female has only got enough room in her body for a few hundred eggs at a time. So throwing those out into the blue and hoping, it's not the best idea. And relying on there being a second opportunity to reproduce when your lifespan's only a couple of months, it just isn't an option. So what cryptos have done, generally, is they've learned lots of different ways to really carefully look after their eggs. 
So lots of cryptos will make a nest. They'll find a little tunnel, a little hole in the reef. They'll clean it out. They'll glue their eggs to the roof of them so the eggs don't get buried in sand. And then the male will guard those eggs and he'll waft clean water over them like any good husband should. <laughs> in other cryptos, like the seahorses and the pipefish, the males have even got a special brood pouch on the tummy. It's this, this yellow area here. And the female will fill that up with eggs, and then the pregnant male will hold on to them until they hatch and he gives birth. This is a cardinal fish, another crypto. In these fish, the males scoop up the eggs after the female lays them, and he'll guard them in his mouth until they hatch. You can see the eyeballs on these. They're almost ready to go. The males in these fish have even got specially adapted mouths, so they're big enough to hold a full clutch of eggs and still let him breathe, which for him is a real bonus. <laughs> so what we've got are a load of cryptos that you use a load of different <coughs> ways to look after their eggs. But when the eggs hatch into tiny baby fish that we call larvae, all bets are off. Most of the time, these guys just get washed out of whatever they were being protected in, and they end up in the blue anyway. But this is where the magic happens. Now, I say magic because we don't really know where they go. But what we do know is that they don't go far. So if you get in a boat and you go 10 kilometers off a reef, which in the scale of the ocean really isn't that far, and you get a fine mesh net, really fine mesh, and you run it through the water, you will catch fish larvae. But out there, the vast majority of them will either be from large reef fish species or from silvery things that spend their whole lives out in the blue anyway. If you want to catch the babies of the cryptos, you have to take that same net and run it through the water really, really close to a reef. These guys don't go anywhere. Now, I know what you're thinking. So what? These little babies get kicked out of the nest and they loiter nearby doing nothing. They're essentially the same as human teenagers. <laughs> but the thing about water is it's always moving. In the ocean, there are waves, there are tides, there are currents. And if you're floating in that water, you'll move with it. Expecting the babies of these fish to be able to stay put is like leaving a four-year-old playing with an umbrella in the garden during a cyclone and expecting them to still be there when you get back. It just wouldn't happen. So how do these fish stay put? Well, the simple answer is we, we don't know. But they do, and we're trying to find out how. And it's this ability for crypto babies to stay put that means that when an adult gets eaten, which we now know they do all the time, there's a baby waiting nearby to take its place. And this is how cryptos can survive when so many are getting eaten so often. And it's arguably the key to the success of this group. It's how there can be so many on a reef. Now, we've looked at the three things that cryptos do. They grow, they die, and they reproduce. Probably not in that order. <laughs> but have I convinced you that these little fish help keep reefs alive? I don't think I have. Because it's only when you start thinking about the three things together that we start to see how important these little fish might be. So what we've got is hundreds of cryptos out on the reef eating this sludge and slime, the waste and detritus, and also lots of little tiny animals on the reef. But it's this detritus, literally just slime on the reef, that actually contains lots of the nutrients that need, we want recycled back into the food webs that we care about. So by eating this material, the cryptos incorporate those nutrients into their bodies they then get eaten by fish a little bit, little bit bigger than themselves, and the cryptos form the foundations of these really impressive and complex coral reef food webs. There's then a cloud of babies waiting nearby to fill in the spots of any adults that have got eaten. They then eat, and they grow really rapidly, and then they get eaten themselves, and so on and so on. What we've got is essentially a constantly replenishing source of food on coral reefs that itself is sustained by the nutrients that need to be recycled. Cryptos are essentially a never-ending jar of sweets on reefs. But these things aren't just a treat. No, we did some mathematical modeling recently. We looked at the birth rates and the death rates and the growth rates of all these fish and compared them to those of large reef fish. And what we found was that about 60% or up to 60% of all fish tissue consumed on coral reefs comes from cryptos. Now, more simply, what that actually means is that if you think of every fish on the reef that gets eaten and it goes up the food web to support the big fish that we care about, it keeps them fat and happy, 60 grams out of every 100 grams of fish that gets eaten on a reef comes from fish that might not weigh a tenth of a gram themselves. 
So around the world, there are hundreds of millions of people who rely on big fish from coral reefs as a source of food or employment. And they're relying on reefs to be able to continue to produce these fish for them into the future. Well, it's probably the smallest fish on the reef that keep this possible. In fact, we really hope that it's cryptos that help keep reefs alive. Thank you.